Uh, good afternoon and happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, we're really thrilled you could join us and um, I want to thank you for being here. I'm Todd Samsel with the Friends of Virgin Islands National Park. In a minute, I'll introduce our speakers for this. Um, <clears throat> but first, wanted to uh, recognize and thank our partners and sponsors uh, for Earth Day. Uh, we certainly all wanted to be here in person um, and have a great in-person event for Earth Day, um, just not to be so. So uh, our sponsors are still supporters and wanted to just thank Island Green Living Association, uh, the Virgin Island Waste Management Authority, um, U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Tourism, and of course our Virgin Islands National Park as uh, par partners in our Earth Day events. Um, we're certainly blessed here uh, on St. John in, in the Virgin Islands to have Virgin Islands National Park. And for those of you who can't be here right now, we're, we're certainly working hard with our National Park Service staff uh, to make sure that we're ready, uh, the park's ready for you when you get to visit again. So we look forward to that. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if everyone could stay muted during the presentation um, and mm -hmm. then, uh, we will have time for Q&A, but if you have a question as we go through and you want to uh, type it up in chat, feel free to do that. We're monitoring that. Um, just a quick disclaimer, we are recording all of our seminars. Uh, we have a lot of classes that, that want to view them later. Um, we'll certainly make them available on our website. Um, so if you don't want to be on video, feel free to shut your video off. Otherwise, we'll take it as your permission to uh, to show, um, show your smiling, happy face on Earth Day uh, to, to folks that watch later. Um, this seminar, uh, our fourth today, is uh, about how our sea turtles are doing. And we're uh, thrilled to have um, folks uh, that work for the National Park Service uh, with support from the Friends um, on our sea turtle program, uh, Willow, Willow Melamet and Adrian Anderson are going to be tag teaming this presentation. Uh, I also believe um, we have a one of our sea turtle volunteer extraordinaires and, and friends board member, Lonnie Clark, who's gonna be on. Um, and so for folks who are interested in uh, the volunteerism aspect of our sea turtle program, uh, we certainly uh, can help answer your questions. Um, they do a lot of great work and we're thrilled to have, have you here uh, so Willow and Adrian, thank you. And um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you um, to lead the discussion. All right, great. Well, happy Earth Day, everyone. Hoping he, my connection is coming in clear for everyone. So welcome, welcome to our talk on sea turtles. So we're here to talk a little bit about turtles that call St. John home, and then also discuss um, some of their plights, um, meaning issues that are uh, kind of cumbersome to their ability to thrive, also the thing that we do here on St. John. So without further ado, I'd like to jump right in and talk about the seven different species of sea turtles. You guys might have heard that there are seven turtles that um, inhabit our world's oceans. Um, so all of them have been around for millions of years, to be exact, almost 110 million years. So that's the time of the dinosaur. Um, these guys thrived as, as a species. Um, their body plan, the way they eat, forage, has all been mainly unchanged for millions of years. And unfortunately, due to our time in recent history, the number of sea turtles is declining dramatically. So of the seven species of sea turtles, all of them are classified as threatened or endangered. Um, so it's definitely very alarming and something that uh, we as a human have to step up and hopefully take it within our hands to help protect them to make sure that these species don't go extinct on our watch. So let's see here. I'm going to try and advance this real quick. So of the seven species, which turtles call St. John home? Um, so if you guys have been to St. John either as residents, you have the privilege of living here, or as visitors that come to our beautiful beaches, 
Um, it's clear to see why St. John is so appealing. So the Virgin Islands as a whole is a wonderful tropical island ecosystem. And the reasons that we're drawn to St. John are some of the same reasons that turtles are drawn to St. John as well. So you can see we have beautiful white sand beaches, clear crystal blue water, uh, wonderful foraging grounds for different various species of turtles, wonderful coral ecosystems. So the reasons that we come here to vacation or to live are some of the same reasons that we find sea turtles here as well. So of the species, the seven species of turtles, we have three main players that we see here in St. John. Uh, one of the most um, prolific nesters is the hawksbill sea turtle. So the hawksbill sea turtle is one of the smallest of the hard shelled turtles. And those are called colonians. So they have that hard shell, the carapace, which is their upper shell, and the plastron, which is their lower shell. So hawksbills get to about um, 100 pounds. So they're relatively small uh, when we start talking about some of those larger species. And um, they get to about three feet in length. Um, so kind of a medium sized turtle. Uh, this turtle is a great representation of what it does best. Um, it lives in those coral ecosystems. So hawksbill turtles are well adapted um, for eating sponges and corals. Uh, so if you're snorkeling, diving, swimming in St. John and you're in a coral ecosystem, you come across a turtle that looks similar to this, uh, eating on coral or sponges, chances are it's gonna be a hawksbill turtle. Uh, so one of the distinguishing features to hawksbills is that beak-like um, structure in their mouth um, that they have, and that's how they got their name hawksbill. So it's much more narrower, and that allows them to eat those sponges and corals. So they're very specialized eaters. So that's a good key distinguishing feature is their beak. Um, also their overall coloration. They're a little bit darker brown. They have red algae that sometimes grows on their soft tissue. And if you had an aerial view of the carapace or the top shell, you would see that their scoots are overlapping. So that is a, definitely a key uh, feature of a hawksbill turtle. Also around that carapace, they have a serrated um, shell as well. So if you got a picture of a turtle or swimming with them, uh, those are some key things that you can pick up on to see what turtle uh, species you're looking at. So that's a nice picture of a hawksbill there. So like I mentioned, hawksbill turtles are one of the main nesters on St. John. Um, so they are the ones that are basically providing the majority of nests that we see here. Uh, so pretty great, we have wonderful sandy beaches that allow them to come up onto shore. Uh, they're nesting usually higher up in that dune ecosystem, so into the vegetation, which does make it a little bit trickier to find their nests. Uh, something a little bit different about hawksbills than some of the other turtle species is that they don't technically have a true distinct season. So hawksbills can be nesting all year round. However, what we consider nesting season is really between July and November. Um, but like I mentioned, they can nest year round because why not? It's beautiful, it's warm, it's sunny. Um, the temperature to incubate eggs is good all year round. Uh, so these turtles can be found nesting throughout the year here in St. John. Uh, so just a little bit about their nesting tactics. Um, they will nest anywhere between three to five times in a season. Um, so that is producing a lot of eggs. Within one nest, we can have anywhere between 80 to 200 eggs, um, usually about the size of a ping pong ball. Uh, they'll lay their nest in an egg chamber, cover it up, usually done at night, and that nest will incubate for anywhere between 55 to 75 days. So if we find a nest on the beach, uh, we will screen it off, protect it, then wait usually about two months to see if there's any hatching activity. So that's kind of the main focus that we have here for our nest monitoring and protection program. Um, but as you can see, hawksbill hatchlings are adorable um, and every single one is important for its species so that nest protection is a very valuable conservation effort. So green sea turtles is the other species of turtle that we see here in St. John. Um, so if you have been here uh, to the island and ever gone to Maho, uh, one of the most beautiful places in my opinion, uh, because these turtles are there. Uh, Maho is a wonderful and special place. It has beautiful white sand beach as well as a wonderful foraging ground with that seagrass. Uh, so seagrass is the main form of food for green sea turtles. Um, as adults, they are almost strictly herbivorous, meaning that they are vegetarians. Um, so they will specialize in either eating seagrass or sea algae, and that primarily makes up the bulk of their diet. Um, so having wonderful, beautiful, intact uh, seagrass beds is very important. Unfortunately, that is on the decline as well. Um, so protecting seagrass beds and their food source is another way that we can help protect sea turtles. Um, but like I mentioned, Maho is a great place to see these wonderful uh, greens. If you are out snorkeling or swimming on the North Shore uh, National Park beaches in St. John, you come across a turtle. Uh, most likely it is going to be a green sea turtle, so take into consideration what it looks like and then also what ecosystem you're seeing them in. 
So if you do uh, stumble upon a wonderful uh, green sea turtle, one of the few characteristics of them are these two prefrontal scoops. So that's a big mouthful. Um, but it's these two scales right in between their eyes. Um, they're elongated and there's only two of them. So that is a good key feature to identifying a green sea turtle. Um, because they also eat seagrass, they actually have a serrated lower jaw. Uh, so turtles do not have teeth. Um, so instead they have adapted to form the serrated lower jaw that allows them to grip and pull the seagrass and eat it. Um, so pretty cool. So they're well adapted to being um, herbivorous foragers. So the greens are definitely a very common species that we see here in St. John. The last main key player or uh, key sea turtle species that we see in St. John is the leatherback sea turtle. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one, but these are one of the most amazing turtles in my opinion, uh, given their grand size. Um, so leatherbacks can exceed six feet in length and over 2,000 pounds. That is a huge, huge animal. Um, and they are living dinosaurs. They are equipped much differently than that of the hard-shelled turtles. Uh, so one key uh, feature is their soft shell. So like it says, it's a leather back. Um, if you were to feel this shell, it would be soft and leathery. Um, it doesn't have that hard shell that we think of with all the other turtle species. And the reason for that is, is that these turtles can dive down 4,000 feet to follow their prey species. So if you guys are familiar with them, they eat something pretty unique. It's actually jellyfish. So they have a, a diet that's almost predominantly based off of jellyfish. They can eat hundreds of pounds of jellyfish a day. Uh, so they're definitely jellyfish eating machines and able to dive down to those depths, those carapace can expand and contract with the pressure of those depth changes, which allows them to be very um, specialized and skilled predators for jellyfish. But pretty amazing that a turtle that large uh, gets so big just eating jellyfish. Uh, we don't see too much leatherback nesting on St. John. Historically though, Trunk Bay has gotten its name Trunk Bay because of the trunk-like turtles that used to nest there. Um, so we do know that there has been leatherback nesting in St. John historically. However, nowadays the main nesting in the Virgin Islands actually takes place at Sandy, um, Croix, Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge, which is in St. Croix. Uh, it's a big hotspot for leatherback nesting activity, um, which is currently going on right now. So they nest a little bit earlier than the other species. The so peak season is around March, April, May. Um, so they're currently nesting now, which means that they are in our waters. So if you're out there on a boat, um, maybe by shore, you might have the lucky fortune of spotting one of these amazing <laughs> giant sea turtles. So those are the three main species that we see. Uh, loggerheads do come into our waters occasionally. However, they are more of a subtropical based species, primarily in the Bahamas, Florida, um, their nesting season will start in May, um, but on those off season for the winter times, we do have loggerheads that come down here um, to forage. Um, so we do see them occasionally, but again, the main ones that we do have here are the Hawksbill, the Green, and the Leatherback. So that was Turtle 101 in a nutshell. Um, just to give you a brief description of some of the turtles that we see here, um, but I wanna turn it over to Adrian so she can talk a little bit about our nesting monitoring and protection program that we have here on island. Oh, thanks, Willow. That was wonderful. Um, now I'm going to share my screen. And so, hey, everyone, I'm Adrian. I've been with the program since 2016. And we'll just take the next few minutes to talk about our program here, uh, what we do, and some of the results from our last season. So the goals of our program here are to establish and maintain a dedicated volunteer base. We want to locate and monitor all the nests and monitor them throughout incubation. We wanna protect these nests from predators and poaching. And upon emergence, we want to measure the nest success to aid in future management techniques and recovery plans. As well as the nest monitoring and protection, we put a lot of effort into educating visitors and locals as well to spread sea turtle conservation awareness. A little lag here, not switching. So we, why is this not working? Sorry guys, there we go. All right, so our um, volunteers attend a training on nesting behavior and track ID 
before season starts so that they have a good idea of what they're looking for when they're out walking the beaches. So again, as Willow said, we're mainly focusing on Hawksbills, so we're trying to capture that peak nesting season between July and November. So at the beginning of this season, the volunteers will be assigned a beach, which they will wake up in the early hours of the morning and monitor those assigned beaches between one and seven times a week. And when they find nesting activity, they will report back to the program. And once we find nesting activity, then we take efforts to protect the nest. So this is a picture of a predator screen right here. These openings are about two inches by four inches, which allows the hatchlings to get out of the screen but deters predators from digging down into the nest. So some of these predators um, here on St. John are mongoose dogs. And so we, we have been placing these screens on the nest for the past couple years, and they've really shown to be successful, greatly reducing the amount of depredation, uh, which is wonderful. So this is in the process of getting um, installed. We will then put around the edges, sometimes stake them if uh, necessary, and we have a little informational sign for areas that we have a lot of um, human activity. Uh, at these nest sites, we also take other measurements, such as the distance from the high tide line, the vegetation type, the distance from the vegetation, shade cover, all of these different environmental factors to help us develop and um, work on management techniques for nest protection in the future. And so one, those nests will incubate around 55 to 75 days and then we'll begin to see signs of emergence. So these volunteers that have been monitoring the nest will see these signs of emergence usually and um, then we will go into the nest and remove the contents of the nest to evaluate the hatch success and the emergent success of the nest. So we, we want to see how many of these eggs yielded baby turtles. So we remove the contents, organize them. Um, the eggshells show us the number of hatchlings that escape from their eggs. And we will often get unhatched eggs too. So we will categorize those by their stage of development. Um, all of this information is important for us to know what kind of environmental factors are affecting the nest and how we can implement management techniques in the future to better protect them and just have a better understanding of the success rates of these um, nests. So from last se this past season, um, I have some stats here I want to share with everyone. And by the way, this is what a Hawksville track looks like, those of you interested. Um, but this past season, we trained 32 volunteers, which contributed to over 750 volunteer hours. Um, so that's incredibly amazing. We really have some amazing people out on the beaches during this time. We monitored 36 beaches and 11 of those beaches had nesting documented on them. So this is the greatest number of nests that we've had in recent history, or nesting beaches documented in recent history. So that's wonderful and I, I really think it's due to the fact that we have more trained individuals out on these beaches more frequently. Um, so the more volunteers we have and the better the efforts, the greater number of beaches we're gonna find nesting on and the greater number of nests we'll also find, hopefully. And so this season we had 35 activities total. So that includes nests and dry runs. And I also say that we have 35 activities in season. So as Willow said, they'll nest, they can nest throughout the whole year, but um, in season goes from July to November. Outside of season, we had four activities. And as Todd was saying earlier, um, one of them just hatched two days ago. 
so it's wonderful to know that there are still little hatchlings pouring out into the ocean um, from St. John. We had 28 nests that were laid during the season, four out of season, and seven dry runs. What I mean by dry run is just when the turtle will come up and it doesn't lay eggs for some reason. It might be um, predator avoidance, there might be a dog running, there might be human-induced threats such as lighting, loud noises, um, interference, or they might just bump into a rock or a log and decide to turn around. So um, seven, of, seven of these 35 activities were, did not yield eggs. And new to this season, we had the permit to relocate nests in danger of storm or sea swell inundation. And we were able to uh, practice that technique uh, once this season. And it was highly successful. It had an 80% hatch success. Um, I also want to point out that one of these nests, one of these 28 nests laid during the season, was a green sea turtle nest. And before 2017, it was thought that green sea turtles didn't nest here on St. John. So we're proud to now know that we have green sea turtle nesting and hope that those numbers and observations will increase in the coming years. So that's all very exciting. These are our excavation results for the in-season nests, so of those 28 nests. We had an average hatch success, which hatch success is the number of eggs that actually hatch. We had the average hatch success of 68%, and that ranges from zero to 99%. We had a couple of storms this past season with um, Tropical Storm Karen, and Hurricane Dorian and several of the nests got inundated with seawater, um, washed over, so that might have yielded to these, some of these lower success, the zero percent successes. And, but several of them were over 80 percent, um, six of them were over 90 percent, so we had some really great successes as well. The average emergent success was 64 0.96%. And the emergent success is how many of those eggs hatch and the hatchlings make it out of the sand. So the hatchlings don't always make it out of the sand. Sometimes the weaker ones get stuck behind. They might get caught up in roots. A variety of factors might leave them behind. And we were able to reveal 97 hatchlings of those in-season nests. And we were able to take them out of the sand and help them find their way to the ocean. And so all in all, with our excavation results, we found that roughly 2,513 hatchlings made it to the ocean, which is incredible. Um, it's very rewarding for the volunteers to see these successes. And the survival rate for a hatchling to make it from hatchling to adulthood is one out of a thousand. So every little bit counts with these turtles. Um, the, these sea turtles face a variety of threats. So our program really helps to, really wants to protect these nets and minimize the threats of these turtles. So now I'm gonna hand it back over to Willow, who is going to talk more about these threats and conservation efforts. Great, thank you, Adrian. So we'll go back over here. I see, got our beautiful leatherback photo. So nesting is such a great way to protect turtles on land and nesting also bridges that gap between land and sea. So from a conservation point, we have this unique opportunity to study turtles both in water and on land and get that valuable information and data about population um, totals and nesting frequency and fidelity by researching and monitoring the nest. And that's great and very valuable information to know how many hatchlings that we do have over 2,000 making it out into the ocean because those numbers are so low to reach maturity. Historically, once a turtle had reached maturity, say at about 30 years of age, there really were no natural predators um, that's gonna take out the larger size class of your adults. 
Unfortunately, now we have a lot of human-based threats that are threatening um, turtles in the higher classes, so your subadults and your adults, um, which is which is alarming and concerning. So um, unfortunately, we do have some main threats that happen to turtles at kind of that higher age class. Um, one of the main leading causes of sea turtle mortality is actually boat strikes. Um, so as you can imagine, there's vessels out in the water, recreational, commercial, we have turtles that come up to the surface to breathe, to bask, and that allows them and makes them very susceptible to being hit by boats. Um, so that's a worldwide human-based threat. Um, entanglement is also another one. Uh, ghost gear, monofilament line, we have derelict gear um, from fishing vessels that's out there floating in the oceans that entangles everything, um, including sea turtles, uh, and leads to drowning. So unfortunately, entanglement is also another big threat that they face. Um, marine debris ingestion. Um, so we all know that plastic pollution is on the rise. Um, and unfortunately for turtles that have been around for millions of years and are very instinctual, um, they have evolved in a time where everything in the ocean that appeared to be a food source was edible. Uh, so take this picture for example, you have a, a jellyfish. Um, a jellyfish in the water looks like a food for, um, source for a turtle, like a leatherback. Unfortunately, they have other man-made objects that are now in the ocean that are non-edible and actually lethal, um, such as plastic bags. So even though we can see the difference between trash and food items for them, they can't. Um, and that leads to a lot of different um, issues such as impaction and um, potentially death long term. Uh, fisheries interaction and bycatch is another main one uh, for sea turtle mortality events. Um, this is anything with getting caught in nets um, for fishing vessels, entangled, Bycatch means that it is not the species that is targeted. Um, so it's a species that is caught um, that is not one that is meant to be caught, but unfortunately has a negative impact on that species. Uh, so for example, in the United States, uh, shrimp fisheries are huge. Um, in the 80s, they developed something called a turtle excluder device, which is a metal grate that goes on a fishing net. This allows shrimp to pass through into the net and allows larger objects such as turtles to hit that grate, end up out of the net. Um, so turtle excluder devices are a major milestone in sea turtle conservation to decrease the amount of bycatch of sea turtles in the United States. And again, simple things like hook and line are all direct impacts that we have on humans that are decreasing sea turtle populations. Of course, there are, are natural based threats as well, um, but these are some that we can control, can help with legislation, different conservation efforts, getting that data, getting that research to help make sure that we are minimizing our impact on sea turtles worldwide. So one major thing that we're seeing here too um, is disease. Um, so disease is something that we see in turtles as well. Um, we have one main disease that is found in all sea turtle species, but is most common in green sea turtles, and it's called fibropapilloma or FP for short to make it a little bit more simple. Um, but if you look closely at this photo, you'll see all these different tumors that are growing around the eyes, around the soft tissues. We have more tumor load down here. Um, this is a turtle that was photographed in Maho. Um, so we do know that we have the FP virus here um, in the Virgin Islands, which is not to be, um, which is to be expected. So it is something that is found in warm tropical waters. Um, the turtles will present with these tumors if they are already immunosuppressed. Um, so this could be from environmental factors such as a limited food supply. It can be from other things such as runoff, fertilizer, human contact, human interaction um, can all negatively impact a sea turtle's overall health to the point that they're presenting with these viral tumors. Uh, so this is something that I hope to monitor more closely um, that we can see through the program um, to research the fibropapilloma a little bit closer. Uh, in the states, there are rehab facilities that are on the forefront of FP uh, research and tumor removal. Um, so to see it here in the Virgin Islands, um, we're kind of coming up to that game of, of how to mitigate this, how to document it, and also just to see each individual's tumor growth. Um, so something that we'll see probably a little bit more of are these FP tumors on green sea turtles. So how can we help sea turtles? Uh, we could probably make a whole presentation just on ways that we can help minimize our impact on the world and also on sea turtles. It is Earth Day after all. Um, but these are just a few uh, uh, that come to mind when I think of ways that we can help sea turtles on a daily basis. Um, one of the main ones is decreasing single-use plastic. So this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, it's something that we can do on a daily basis to help change our ways in little 
little changes uh, every day. Um, so things like using a reusable cup instead of plastic water bottles, using a reusable canvas bag instead of grocery bags is really going to help minimize the amount of plastic it makes out into our oceans and can be seen as a food source to these sea turtles. Uh, so I challenge everyone to try and decrease the amount of plastic they use on a daily basis. Think critically of what you're consuming and what you're using and see what you can do to make those changes in hopes of helping sea turtles. Uh, eating sustainable seafood. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Seafood Watch. This is from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, but they have a wonderful app that you can get right on your phone. And it's updated, I think every quarterly, so four times a year. And it basically shows you which seafood is in season. How is it harvested? Where is it caught? Is it farmed? Is it wild caught? And it kind of helps guide you through what are the best seafood options um, to eat. So that way you can feel good about the food that you're eating and making sure that it doesn't have a negative impact on sea turtles by the way it's caught or harvested. So if you're here on St. John as a resident or a visitor, um, some things that you can do to help minimize your direct impact on turtles is to practice safe and responsible boating. Um, so making sure that you are abiding by those no wake zones or those swim areas, using those dinghy channels, making sure that you're not going fast in an area where sea turtles are known to be. Being vigilant, watching for them uh, are all ways that we can help minimize the impact or potential risk of a boat strike injury. Uh, to do not disturb the turtles or a nest. So if you are here um, on the island and you see a nest to make sure that you leave it alone. If you do happen to see a nesting female to do not disturb, uh, to be sure not to take photography uh, or flash photography of that turtle. Um, believe it or not, the hatchlings and uh, the nesting female are very susceptible to bright lights. Uh, hatchlings will disorient to things such as house lighting. So if you're staying on a beachfront villa, making sure that your house is dark during that July to November season will help to make sure that those hatchlings make it back out into the ocean. Also simple things like if you dig a hole in the beach, cover it back up. Those hatchlings are making their way out to the ocean and if they have a giant hole that they have to go through, it's gonna make it longer and harder for them to make it out into the ocean. And then of course, just picking up after yourself when you visit the beaches, making sure that you're making it cleaner than when you first came there. Um, lastly, supporting conservation organizations. So there are so many wonderful conservation organizations out there that are ready on the front lines of conservation. They have well-established programs like the ones here funded by the Friends of the Virgin Islands National Park to help protect sea turtles. So being able to be a part of those organizations, either financially or by volunteering, is going to help sea turtles in the long run. So lastly, if you are in a position to get involved and you are here on St. John, uh, there are a few things that you can do. Uh, so what do you do if you see a sea turtle track? That's a great question. Uh, please make sure you do not disturb the area or walk on the crawl. You can take photos of the track and you can contact us via email or call the National Park Service. So that allows um, us to know that there is a crawl out there, either a dry run, a false crawl, or maybe a nesting activity. And that'll give us time to go out and uh, stake that off. Hopefully it is a nest and protect that nest. Um, so having eyes on the beach is great. If you do happen to find a sick, injured, or dead turtle, uh, there's an organization called STAR. STAR is the Sea Turtle Assistance and Rescue Program. Uh, so this is a collaboration of territory and federal agencies, uh, community leaders, veterinarians that have all come together to help be the stranding response for sick and injured turtles. Um, so if you do happen to see a turtle floating at the surface of the water, it's not moving, it looks like it has a lot of fibropapilloma tumors, it's stranded on the beach, um, those are all cause for concern. Uh, you can please uh, give us a call at the National Park Service or through the number listed right here, uh, the STAR network number and that'll allow people to come out and to either respond to that uh, stranding event or to help that sick or injured turtle. So that's a good number to remember if you're here locally. Uh, lastly is volunteering. Uh, so like Adrian said, this program could not happen without volunteers. They're definitely the backbone of the whole program as a whole. They're the ones out there every morning uh, monitoring these nests, looking for new nesting activities, and that could not be done without volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering, uh, trainings will be held in June. Uh, so we're gearing up here to start um, doing some social media blasts about uh, more information in regards to when those trainings will be held. Um, so please stay in tune with the Friends of the Virgin Island National Park Facebook page, Instagram, uh, the Virgin Island National Park social media platforms as well for more information.
So thank you everyone. I hope you guys had a great time learning a little bit more about the sea turtles that call St. John home and then also just celebrating Earth Day with us virtually. Um, we're here for a little bit longer, I believe. So if anyone has any questions, we can open it up uh, for any sea turtle questions you all may have. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, can people take the volunteer course just to know what they're looking for if they're on a beach? Yeah, so just to be part of those trainings. Um, yeah, but actually what that looks like, you know, et cetera, that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's welcome to anyone that might be interested. So those trainings would be great. So if you would just like to have more general information uh, about the program, what to look for with the tracks, uh, we do highly encourage everyone to come out, learn a little bit more, and then figure out how much um, availability they have and how much they would like to contribute to the program. Nice. Yeah. Willow, we have a question from Lisa. Yeah, Lisa, hi. <laughs> hey, this is Lisa's husband, actually. Oh, okay. Hey, <laughs> She's working, I'm watching. Um, you, you mentioned that the habitat at Maho Bay, um, have, you been, have you seen any decrease in population or health since the opening of the Maho Crossroads there? We were there this February and just the amount of extra people was really jarring. Yeah, it is interesting to see um, the amount of people that now go to Maho as historically. Um, I've been on island for about a year and within that time frame, just anecdotally, the amount of FP turtles with FP tumors does seem to be on the rise. Um, it is difficult to assess the causation of the tumors as a whole, um, just by the virus itself. Um, but we do know that there is a lot of human interaction there. These turtles do lend themselves very well to getting close to them, uh, which could cause some immunosuppression, uh, which could lead to the tumor development. Uh, it's hard to correlate that with Maho Crossroads, um, but we are seeing uh, tumor turtles at Maho. So that's as much as, as I can say um, from my personal observation. I mean, what, if anything, can be done to uh, monitor more or, or guard? Yeah, um, I think something that we could work on is to identify individual sea turtles with the tumors. Um, that way, once we have photographs of these turtles, we can identify how many individuals are at Maho, uh, just to get a stand-up point for that population. Uh, so are there certain turtles that are just in Maho and that's where they live and they forage? Are we having more transients come in or other turtles recruiting to that area? Um, something that I've seen is a lot more juveniles. Um, so we're seeing a smaller size class coming into Maho as well. Um, so I think just more research development and hopefully future research projects will come from that um, to get a little bit more data um, to, to be able to overall see um, Maho and, and the turtles there just to monitor it. All right, thanks, appreciate it. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. <laughs> um, out of 25 hatchlings, 2,500 hatchlings, I've never seen one. Where do what? they typically go? <laughs> yeah, we'll have to change that. <laughs> yeah. Where do they go? Like, where do so, they live for a while? Yeah, so hawksbills, so from here, they can go up into the North Atlantic. So hawksbills and sea turtles have something that's called the lost years. So the last years are really the first 10 years of a sea turtle's life. Uh, so this is a big conservation question that Archie Carr rose in the 50s. Um, he's like, where do the turtle hatchlings go? You don't see them until they recruit back to coastal ecosystems by the time they're about the dinner plate size. Um, so it is said that they go out to the sargassum seaweed and they follow the currents of the North Atlantic, maybe even the Caribbean Sea, depending on where the currents are taking them from here. They spend anywhere between five to 10 years out there foraging, living in the sargassum seaweed um, before they recruit back to the coastal ecosystems. Uh, so we don't normally see hatchlings here growing up, uh, but you will start to see them once they're about that 10 pound size class. We have had turtle uh, presentations from partners at University of Virgin Islands um, and folks over there doing research. And it's interesting, the, the bay uh, right off the airport uh, on St. Thomas is a favorite spot for those dinner plate sized hawksbills to come okay. back to. And we've seen a few of them around St. John, but that seems to be a hot spot. Awesome. Other questions? Jennifer, when we excavate the nests, 
oftentimes we see stragglers. I know I saw quite a few babies this year um, as a result of that. So we'll have to get you out to one of those this year. Yeah. When you, when you start to excavate, excavate the nest and you find those eggs that didn't hatch, when do you make the decision to, to dig them up and go, maybe they're not going to hatch? Like when most of them have hatched? So, and you're like, these aren't just aren't going to hatch. We need to dig them up and separate them, and divide them. That's a great question. And during season, so during that July to November period, um, the nest will usually hatch before 80 days. So usually it's between 55 and 75, around 55. So if we haven't seen any signs of hatching, we'll wait until day 80 and dig it up. Um, if there's any cause for concern, like the eggs look like they're still incubating, they're white, fresh, um, just immediate, we'll immediately cover them up. That shouldn't happen. Um, but in the season, especially these out of season nests, when the temperatures are a little cooler, it's it's a little more tricky because some of those nests will go for a lot longer than 75 days. So we really wait a long time to to excavate those. We the nests have gone over 90 days. One that was laid at the end of. Um, or the beginning of January just went over a hundred days. Wow. So then it's just kind of wait and see and eventually dig it up. Um, because you you don't want to disturb the nest. You uh, That's the exact opposite of what we want to do is to disrupt the incubation. But um, the sooner you can get to the nest, the, the less, rotten the contents are and the looking and sorting through everything's just going to be easier the fresher it is but definitely erring on the side of caution absolutely right. does a sea turtle ever come back to its nest or they lay it they're gone they're they're gone yeah. they're gone <laughs> no parental care <laughs> <Mother> Julia, <now. laughs> yep. we, we have a question from julia Hi, this is Julia Paxman from Vermont. And I was wondering, are you able to get onto any of the private beaches, say Ditliff, or to monitor those beaches? Yeah, so there, um, actually this past season, um, some of the nests have been in those private beaches. And that's just depending on which beaches they are and the coordination with the access beaches so it definitely is an option and I don't know anyone who is unwilling to with sea turtle conservation so everyone has been very wonderful and um, at allowing us to get on get onto the beach and monitor for nesting activity and have gotten really excited about it as well um, yes that's great I used to live on St. John and before Ditliff, Ditliff was bought, I was able to go down and spend time there. My friend and I were able to walk, so to speak, a hatchling to the water. And it was just an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. So that's great. That, just a concern. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. So we have questions from Kelly and then Deborah. Hi, um, I'm Kelly. I'm from Michigan, and um, I used to spend time at Veers for about 15 years. And I was just curious if you did um, the turtle training virtually, or how long the training takes if you want to be a volunteer to work with the turtle conservation. At the moment, um, we've never done anything virtually. That might be something, and more of. Um, informational sessions like this. This is kind of opening our eyes to what we can do. Mm -hmm. Might be something exciting to look forward um, to in this season. Um, the training is, we do want to make sure that the volunteers are well trained. So it does right. going out on the beach and really having an understanding of what we're looking for. 
So a lot of, so we do ask that the volunteers are committed to monitoring for if possible. Some people need to leave for a little while and can um, only volunteer for a month or so, which is wonderful, but for visiting volunteers, an option might be to go to the beach with a current volunteer and kind of just get a hands-on experience in that way. Um, okay. That's something that people do, visitors to the island have done before, coming down here and walking on the beach, maybe with a volunteer, maybe with Willow, um, to get out there and learn more about turtles and also help out. Okay, thank you. Deborah. Uh, any other questions? If there aren't other questions, um, or if you come up with something later, don't hesitate to get a, a hold of the friends. We can certainly put you in contact with uh, Willow and Adrian. Um, but I wanted to thank you both for um, presenting and um, uh, giving us great information on our sea turtles on this 50th Earth Day. I want to thank everybody for participating. And uh, we certainly look forward to seeing you here on St. John again soon. Wonderful. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, okay. everyone, for joining in. Thank you, guys. You did great. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you. Bye. All Happy right. Happy day. <laughs>